Again, welcome everyone. Um, I wanted to start with that song because it's really going to work well with this uh, lesson tonight and as we study this chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But let's read it together and then we'll pray. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a joy and a delight it is, God, to just uh, be with the uh, family of God tonight and just study Your Word. And knowing, God, that Your presence is here, knowing that the Teacher, Your Holy Spirit, is not just in us, but He's here among us. And Father, I thank You that as we open our heart to Your Word tonight, that we'll be filled. As we hunger and thirst for the righteousness uh, that You so graciously offer us in knowledge and wisdom and instruction, that we'll receive it, God. So Father, thank You for the opportunity to share tonight. I pray, God, that You be glorified in everything uh, that I say and that uh, we would grow because of the Word that we've heard tonight. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So, here we are. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The famous and iconic love chapter of the Bible. Right? And I was really thrilled to be able to teach this because this has changed my life. And I know I say that a lot about the Word of God, but it's true. And that's actually a good confession that we should have that the Word has changed our life because Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says that we're transformed, that's changed, by the renewing of our mind. So it should be an ongoing thing that we confess, man, the Word is changing me. Amen? So this, so this chapter is, is definitely so full of revelation and just uh, powerful identity truth and, and I hope to share some really... Uh, Really good things that you can apply to your life uh, that I have tonight. So, I chose that song. I started this song because um, I was recently invited to teach the kids at North River at their chapel, and and I was praying. I said, I said, God, I want to I want to teach something that they can pick up, something easy. You know, I'm not used to teaching kids, so uh, I know sometimes I can be I can get a little deep and. Uh, I can really get excited about the word and rabbit trail and all this stuff. So um, I'm learning and I'm growing, you know, give me grace. But uh, but I wanted something that they could really pick up on and something I could challenge them with that they could apply to their life. So I prayed about it and I landed on uh, the uh, the uh, uh, illustration of the wise and the foolish builder. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. See, I'm thankful he's here. <laughs> But uh, the illustration of the wise and foolish builder. And, uh, and in that, you all know that story, but, but in that, um, 
Jesus says, Whoever hears these words of mine and does what I say, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. He says, the rains fell, the streams rose, and they beat against that house, and it stood because it was founded on the rock. He says, whoever listens to these words of mine and doesn't do what I say, he is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Same thing, the rains fell, the streams rose and beat against that house, and he says, and it fell, and great was its fall because it wasn't founded on the rock. And I use this illustration, but Proverbs chapter 1, uh, verse 7 says, uh, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And I use this illustration of this right here, and I said, I said, guys, if I was going to build that, and I had all the parts, I had all the pieces, and I was going to endeavor to build that, I have no idea how it fits together, no idea how all the parts work together and the pieces go and what steps they go in and all that stuff. But if I was going to even try to endeavor to build that, what do I need? Instructions. Right? So if I have the instructions to this, and I, and I, and I again, I, my desire is to build that, if I have the instructions, and I, you know, maybe it comes in a box, and I, I've done this before, and I'm sure you guys, if you've been here, uh, if, and you're in here, and you're going to be honest, some of you have too, but whether we get, you know, we might get have a toy that our kids get for Christmas, or your, your wife buys furniture that you got to build, and depending on how intricate it is and how complicated it is, you know, I might flip the box around and look for a really good picture, and then throw away those instructions and say, I can do that. Right? Anybody ever done that? We do. And that's either pride, it's laziness, or stupid. I'll just use the word foolish like Jesus used, right? It's foolish to throw away the instruction. But we do it. Um, but nine times out of ten, uh, if I've tried to do that, something's gone wrong. Whoever designed this thing right here, there's two purposes for it the designer made for it. It's got a life that it's supposed to endure and it's got a functionality, right? A lifespan and a functionality. And if I throw away those instructions and I try to build it on my own, chances are it's not going to have the life that it was supposed to have and it's not going to function the way it was supposed to function. You with me? And not only that, but whoever designed this carefully went through all the, uh, the effort and the details to write out those instructions so that whoever bought that product or whatever it was could make sure it's built to spec and, and so that it would fill, fulfill its purpose. Sound familiar? That's the Word of God. The beginning... Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, how does this, how does this connect with love, Sean? I'm glad you asked. 1 Timothy 1.5, Paul says this. He says, the purpose of the commandment is love. From a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Other translations say this, and I like this. It says, the goal of our instruction is love. I believe that that foundation that the house is built on is the love of God. That's what I believe that. I believe it's the love of God. And so what we've got to know is that what we're about to study tonight in this chapter is impossible to walk in without the power of God. Because it's not just, listen, this is, I've said this before, but this is not just how God wants us to love. This is how He loves. In fact, He is love. 1 John 4 8 says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So you could actually interchange that word love with God suffers long, God is kind. God does not envy. God does not parade Himself. And I'm going to go through these, hopefully, if I have time and I don't rabbit trail and go all kinds of places. 
And I'm going to show you that each one of these characteristics of love, God has demonstrated for us. And it's true. But I want to jump off with this right here. Again, this is not just how God wants us to love. It is, it, is, uh, it is His love. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. And I want to show you something just before we start going into this. If the foundation that we're building our life on is God's love, then I would say that that's the purpose of our life. The purpose of our life, if Paul's saying the goal of our instruction, uh, the purpose of the commandment, the goal of our instruction, or the end of, end of the commandment, whatever translation you want to use, is the end game, guys, is for us to become love. It's for us to walk. I say become love, but to walk in love is to become like Jesus, right? Romans 8, 29, Paul says this. He says, God's predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son. And Jesus was the living epistle of love. What's this? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and there it is, walk in love, as Christ also loved us and given Himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Now, let me just, let me just uh, break this down for you. Therefore, be imitators of God, followers of God, as dear children, that's identity, and walk in love as Christ. Walk in love as Christ. See, God never sets us up to fail. He always sets us up, sets us up to succeed. And for us to follow Christ, for us to follow Jesus, which He said we should, then He has to do it first. Right? We can't follow where He hasn't gone. If, if He didn't say it, we can't follow Him. If He didn't go there, we can't follow Him. If He didn't minister like that, we can't follow Him. We're following Him. And He is the love of God. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, it says that God chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in Him. In who? In Christ. In love. In the love of God. And so, that's, that's purpose. To become the love of God. To walk in the love of God. Everybody agree with that? That's, a, that's our purpose, right? To become the love of God. Remember, we're created for His image and for His glory. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 says, all things were created uh, for your glory, by your will, and for your pleasure they were created. So we're created for God's glory. And He gets glorified when we walk in love. Amen? So that's purpose. So if that's our purpose, how do we fulfill that purpose to walk in love? How do we fulfill it? Go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 15. Now watch the connection here. Jesus says, if you love me, keep, treasure, guard, protect my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. If you love Me, keep My commandments. So what's He saying there? Sean, if don't, don't, obey me because someone told you you had to or you feel like you're obligated to or uh, you know uh, you feel like if you don't I'm going to punish you obey my commandments because you love me because you see why God sent me over and over Jesus says the one who sent me or this is the will of the this is the will John 640 says this is the will of him who sent me 
that whoever believes in me uh, will not perish uh, and have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. A, a lot of times, you look in the go Gospels, Jesus says that. He adds those words, the one who sent me. What's he trying to say? He's saying, the Father sent me for you, for me. For what? To become love. We make a big, we, we make a, a, a wrong perception when we look at the life and the ministry of Jesus and say, yeah, but that was Jesus. No. Yes, it was Jesus, but we're missing the fact that that was love. That was love. If God, if, if, if it wasn't possible for us to follow Jesus, who was love, He wouldn't have asked us to. This, this whole thing, uh, and I know there's, there's, you know there's a lot of things in here, and we can, the Bible's like, you know, it's, it's a mirror. We look in it and we see, my son was, we were on the way to school uh, today or yesterday, and, and uh, you know, he's at that age where he's kind of looking at himself in the mirror, and, you know, and he's looking at his, look, looking down at his phone, and, uh, and I said, what you doing? I said, you're looking at yourself, aren't you? He goes, he goes, yeah. I said, I said, what are you looking for? He says, I'm just checking to make sure my hair's okay and everything else. I said, so you're looking in the mirror, right? And you trust what you see? Yeah. I said, that's what the Word of God is for. But for our spiritual mirror. So we look in the physical mirror. James says the same thing. We look in the physical mirror to make sure all our hair's in place and everything. And we trust what we see and we make adjustments according to it. It's the same way with the Word of God. We look in the Word of God and we see how we are spiritually. And we make adjustments according to the mirror. Right? And so, so God's, God's given us an example. Jesus showed us how a man of God can be filled with the Holy Spirit and walk in love. Walk in the love of the Father. I only do what the Father tells me to say. I only, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only say what the Father tells me to say. So, Sean, if you love me, your desire is going to be to keep my commandments, to obey me. Remember Paul's word to uh, Timothy? The purpose of the commandment is love. Remember they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? It's one commandment, but there's two parts to it. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others, your neighbor, as yourself. I can't love you the way that, if I don't understand, let me put this way, if I don't understand and get a revelation of how God loved me, I can't let that love flow out of me to you. i got to receive it first. We can't give what we haven't received. And that's why it's important to keep ourselves in the love of God. Jude chapter 1, verse 20, But you, beloved, build yourself up in your most holy faith, keeping yourselves in the love of God. It's powerful. All right, so let's go back to uh, 1 Corinthians. So purpose, and that's the power. That's the power to do it right there. The Holy Spirit. He was sent to help, help us in every way. And Lord knows we need help. You know how I know that? And I, and I don't want to step on toes. I know that people go through stuff and, and, and whatnot, but this... You know, this chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians about what love is, and I've already made that, that statement that this is not just how God wants us to love, but it is His love. But verse 8, and we'll get there, it says, love never fails. That word fails, it means fall out of. And we don't need to, we don't need to even, you know, it's it's pretty prevalent that we're missing something because the divorce rate in America is through the roof. And yet this passage of Scripture is used in almost every wedding in this country. So something, there's a disconnect somewhere. So we're learning, we're growing, learning how to walk in God's love. But we need to. And too many people have thrown away the instructions and they're trying to build their life apart from the instruction manual of the Word of God. And that's why it falls apart. 
I'm preaching that to myself too. All right, so let's, let's kind of go through this. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Oh, let me just connect this real quick first. All right, so, so this in context, you know, Paul's, he's been encouraging the church, pastoral letter to the church, and he's addressing certain things, and he's encouraging these believers. And so he says, but earnestly desire the best gifts. Now, in this same, in this chapter before this, he talks about spiritual gifts and, you know, uh, the placement in the church and working on miracles and prophecy and all these kind of things. But verse 7, he says, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So watch this. He says, but earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet now I show, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Here's what I believe Paul's saying. Now, he's already told us that every, every part of the body does its own part and not one's exalted higher than the other. It, it's all, we're all connected and we're all for one purpose and that's to glorify the Lord. There's one Spirit, one baptism, one Lord of all. And so he's already encouraged us with that. So when he says the best gifts, plural, if you have the best of something, you have the best of something, right? There's nothing better, right? So if he's saying the best gifts, that wouldn't make sense because there's, there's a plural there. Gifts, right? But if miracles aren't greater than healings and if healings aren't greater than prophecy and prophecy isn't greater than tongues, then that wouldn't make sense, right? So the best gifts are, I believe, is what's needed at that moment. See, when we don't, when we, and this is what they did wrong here. They, they were finding their identity in their gifting. And they were comparing each other with each other and measuring each other by each other. And Paul said that's not wise. Because that's going to bring the focus on you. And we're supposed to be crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, not Christ, yet, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. So, so we're supposed to be, we're supposed to be uh, dead to ourselves and letting God and letting the Holy Spirit live through us. So if I open myself up to being a conduit and being a vessel, earthen vessels, uh, for His glory, then He can use me anywhere He wants. Right? And why should... And, and so when we think about gifting, and I don't want to go too much into that, but I look at Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me. The same Spirit. Jesus didn't do anything without the Holy Spirit. So the same Spirit that, uh, you know, that, that did all those things that Jesus did, healed blind Bartimaeus, uh, made the paralytic walk and take up his mat and go home, fed the 5,000, that same Spirit lives in me. It's not a different Spirit. And Jesus didn't limit himself to gifting. He just says, he says in, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, he says, sacrifice and offering, talking to the Father, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. As it is written in your book, I have come to do your will, O God. So we're vessels, Paul says this, that we're to offer ourselves as living sacrifices our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to Him. So He should be able to do with me whatever He wants as long as I'm, as long as I'm tracking with Him. Earnestly desire the best gifts. Watch how this connects. This is really good. Psalm 37.4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. So if my desire is, God, I just want to flow in Your love. I just want to be open to anything and everything that you want to do, 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 do with me. I want to be there at the moment, right time, right place, with the right heart motivation. I want to be tracking with you so that, we, so, so, that we're, so that we're in sync. How can two walk together lest they agree? So if that's my desire, then how many of you know when the opportunity comes, and by love I see the opportunity, and I'm going to talk about this, but kindness is a good work kindness is doing good and when i see that and i step up to the plate and i said here i am god use me and he can and he does earnestly desire the best gifts here's another reason why i know that because 
It says, earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I now show you a more excellent way. If you go to the first uh, verse in, in chapter 14, he says, pursue, follow after love. So we're not pursuing gifts. We're not trying to chase down gifts. We're chasing him down. We're following him. We're following love, pursuing love. And when we do that, we're going to, like he said, the goal of our commandment, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. You could do another lesson out of just those three points right there, but it's pretty powerful. So, so now I've connected it. Now watch this. Verse Verse thir- uh, chapter 13, verse 1 through 3. I'll read them again, but look at it. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. I can sum these three... three uh, verses up with 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 one thought here paul says i don't care if you're the most spiritual giant that ever walked this planet i don't care if you could be the keynote speaker for every gospel truth seminar or a faith-filled uh 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 conference in the whole planet but if you have not love it profits you nothing nothing it does nothing for the kingdom of god and it's not going to do anything for you. Look what he says. It doesn't profit you anything. You know what I thought about when I, when I, when I read this? I think about this. I think about the, the parable of the, of the talents where, where the, the owner gave the, t- the talents to his servants. And you all know the story. But the one that hid the, the one talent, and he gave each, remember, he gave each to their own ability. That's why we don't compare each other with each other and measure each other by each other. God knows what we're able to do. And He's never going to set us up to fail. He's always going to set us up to succeed. But He told told the one that hid the talent, He says, oh, if you knew me me to be a hard man and to reap what I have not sown, then you should have put it in the bank and, and gained me interest. And He says to His servants, He says, throw the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know what that tells me? that we're supposed to be making a profit for the Lord. If He's the owner, and the talents aren't ours, they're His. He's invested them in us, and we need to make a return on His investment. And that's why it's so important. I'm going to make a plug here for serving in the church, because all the gifts and the abilities and the talents that we have, we're stewards of them. They don't belong to us. They're God's. And He's given us each, according to our ability, that level of talent or that ability or or that that gift, whatever it is, to plug into the church as part of the body to support as every joint supplies and to build, build each other up, but to bring Him glory. If you're sitting out there with a gift and a talent that you're not using for the kingdom of God, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a big deal, and this is. I look up this word. It actually means this. It's it means benefit. I love this word. It's advantageous, which means involving or creating favorable circumstances that increase the chances of success or effectiveness. How many of you want your faith to be effective? I would say everybody's going to raise their hand. Do you know what the Bible says? I love, I love, I love thinking about this. You know, in Psalms 119, it talks about the word being a, a treasure and, and finer than pure gold and pure silver. And when we dig into the word, man, we're going on a treasure hunt. And there's, there's nuggets of truth in the word of God. Like you, you need to get context. So, like, like we said, in this context, Paul's talking to a, a backwards church and he's trying to shape and mold them in, 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 the, in the word. But in this, There are spiritual treasures that we can uncover to apply to our life. And I'm going to give you one of the biggest ones that I ever found in the Word 
And it's, and it's pretty hidden. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 7 says that, uh, that sound, uh, the, good, the, the Lord lays up sound wisdom for the righteous. So it's, it's laid up, it's hidden away for us to find because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we, Jesus says, seek, you will find. Just in case you missed it, Sean, he who seeks will find, right? So here's a, here's a great nugget of truth. I'll share it with you. And it's, it's, a, it's a nuclear bomb of, of power. It's in a little letter that Paul wrote to a slave owner named Philemon. Anybody ever read that, that letter? And in that letter, Paul's encouraging the slave owner to uh, not be hard on, on, on Onesimus, Onesimus, who ran away. And Paul says, he's been beneficial to me. So, I, you know, I, I, I want you to do the right thing. I brought you into the faith and, and kind of like, you know, uh, you owe me, but I'm, I'm going to leave that up to you. you you've, I know you do the right thing. And, and so, uh, but he pleads for this guy Onesimus. But in that in that letter, he says this. He says, I pray that the communication of your faith becomes effectual through the, through the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Let me say that again. The communication, that means the transferal of your faith and my faith becomes effectual, starts working through the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. You ever wonder why I, I just my faith just, just, just don't seem to work? Do you know every good thing that's in you? Have you meditated on that? Have you thought about that? Have I thought about that? Because that's what's that that's what it's not true. Just rip it out of your Bible. It's true, right? It's truth. Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man a liar. That, that to me, I don't know if that excites you, but to me it does. I mean, we all want our faith to be effective, right? And we all want the transferal of it to be effective, the, the communication of your faith. I don't care if, you, if you're encouraging somebody with a word, if you're laying hands on the sick, if you're trying to free somebody from demonic oppression, if you're just uh, you know, doing a good work here, whatever it is, the communication of your faith becomes effectual, starts working through the acknowledging of every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus. So this word prophet, that's what it means. Involving or creating favorable circumstances that increase the chances of success or effectiveness. I love that because we got to remember that Ephesians 3.20 says that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, but it's according to the power that works in us. His power, but it works in us. And faith without works is dead, and on and, and, on, and on. But these three verses, they can be, they can be kind of summed up with that. And let me just, let, let's just go here real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 9 through 15, talking about these three things and, and, and how, you know, you could be the biggest spiritual giant on the planet, but if you have not love, it profits us nothing. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 15. We've already read this. I think Jeff taught this. Oops, sorry. Sorry. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 15. Uh, right here. Look at this. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, and you are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I laid the foundation. There it is, the foundation again. And another builds on it. But let, another, let each one take heed how he builds on it. He's talking about teachers and preachers. Paul's saying, I laid the foundation that somebody else might be building on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day, capital D, will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he, built, which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but for himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So he's saying anything that's not done with a motivation of love is going to burn up. It's going to burn up. And we're going to lose the reward. 
But if it's done with a motivation of love, it's going to withstand the fire of God, the, the testing of fire. Right? All right, let's move on. So, so now we're going to get into the characteristics of what love is. And I'm not going to be able to go through all of them, but I want to hit some of them. He says, love suffers long, or love is long-suffering. Um, a lot of translations say love is patient. He says, love suffers long. I thought about two scriptures here, and I got to do this quick. But uh, but remember, this is uh, when I read this and I think about this. I always try to think this is how God loves, and I'm becoming this love. But Second Peter three nine says that um, God is not slow as some count slowness. And in in, in, in the in context, you know, the church Peter's encouraging the church, and they're and they're talking about how then people are saying, you know, where's this Jesus that you're talking about? He's not coming. You know the uh, we're, we're looking. We don't see anything. The same thing that happened in Noah's day. We don't see. Where's the sign of his coming? You know, and they're and they're kind of they're they're kind of uh, you know uh, yeah mocking the church. Thank you, uh, mocking and, and riding the and, and riding the people that are trying to preach the gospel and say that Jesus is coming back and to be ready. And Peter says, God is not slow as some count slowness. But he's long suffering. He's patient, not willing that any should perish, but all to come to repentance. Love suffers long. The Bible says in First Peter chapter four, I think it is, says in the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Now think about that. The long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah when the ark was being built. How long was the ark built? 120 years, right? So what is that? And I, and, and I had to, I actually was corrected uh, uh, when I was kind of going through my notes and thinking about some scripture here because I look at 2 Peter 3, 9 and I say, God is not willing that any should perish, but he's patient with us, not willing that any should perish. And if that's the truth, then that had to be true in Noah's day too. And if God, were, if the long suffering of God waited when Noah was building the ark for 120 years, did God was was God hoping that other people would get on the ark? Have you ever thought about that? And I thought that must be what it means, but it doesn't mean that. And as I thought about that this morning, I remembered that when God told Noah that He was going to flood the earth and the end of all flesh had come, He said, "But you make an ark." with gopher wood and gave him all the specs and all that, all that. And he said, he says, you and your wife and your sons and their daughters will enter the ark. And he never mentioned anybody else. And it says in that, in that passage, it says, but eight souls were saved by water, which is a type of baptism. So, so God wasn't trying to get other people on the ark. So the long suffering of God was this. The Bible says in, in, in that same story that, that in chapter 6, verse 5, it says that God looked on the earth and He saw that all the, every thought and intent of the heart of man was only evil continually. Think about that. 20, we think the world's bad now. Think about that. 24-7, seven days a week, every thought and the intent of their heart was only evil continually that's a lot of evil with all those people and he says but and it says but noah found favor in the eyes of the lord so the long suffering of god was that he had to that that evil had to continue for another 120 years and it's really it's it's really a uh jesus says as in the days of noah so will it be in the coming of the son of man and and it, that testimony of noah being a preacher of righteousness as he was building that ark you know, I think about the parent walking by with his son, you know, and, and they're hearing this. Randy preached on this one time. He says, Dad, what the heck's that guy doing? Uh, son, he's building an ark. He's crazy. He thinks that the world's going to end. He thinks God's going to flood the earth with, with rain, and it's never even rained here before. They don't even know what rain is. And, uh, and But the, every morning they hear that sound. And the Bible says when Noah entered the ark, it was until seven days later that the rain started to fall. So now he's in the ark, and now they're like, Dad, where'd that guy go? Oh, he get in the boat, kid, son. Well, what's he doing, Dad? 
I don't know. He thinks God's going to flood the earth. Well, what do we believe, Dad? Ah, we don't believe that stuff. We believe this or we believe that. As soon as that first drop fell, you know what happened. But it was the long suffering of God. And it's the same way now. So for us, notice it says love suffers long. It doesn't suffer forever. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, he says, but the sufferings that you're going to endure right now are nothing compared to the glory that shall be revealed in you. So love suffers long. We're going to have to put up with some things as, while we're here on this earth. And if we're tracking with God, we'll know that God's, God's stay in His wrath and, and Jesus isn't coming back yet because every day that Jesus doesn't come back, your family member has a chance to get saved and mine does too. Right? So we want to track with God in the way that we're... Jesus says, whoever doesn't gather with me scatters. That's a real sobering Scripture right there. We need to be busy. We need to be about our Father's business, and we need to be sowing that word out there. Uh, love is kind. And, and that, that kind doesn't, doesn't mean behavior. It doesn't mean a certain kind of behavior. Like, you know, just that guy just keeps to himself. He's a kind old man. No, no it, it actually means doing good. It's an action word. And, the, and there's a couple Scriptures here, but I'll just give you one. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, it says that God raised us up together with Christ and seated us together with Him in the heavenly places. Verse 7 says, in order that in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So it's an action word. Uh, I think it's Titus that says, um, but when the kindness of God appeared, through Jesus Christ, we were saved. Let me go to that. Let me go to that scripture real quick. That is three, three through five. For we ourselves were once also fool. We, were, we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and hate, envy, hateful, and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He has poured, on us, poured out on us abundantly. So kindness is an action word. The Bible says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, that Jesus was, uh, was filled with the Holy Spirit and with power and went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So kindness is an action word. It's actually a fruit of the Spirit. Through his spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, uh, gentleness, and, and so on and so on. So it's an action word. And again, that happens through the acknowledging of every good thing that's in us in Christ Jesus. When we see ourselves in Christ Jesus and Him in us, all we got to do is abide. He produces the fruit. All we got to do is abide, right? So uh, let's move on. Does not envy. Now, this is an interesting one because it's the one of the big ten here. Thou shalt not covet. Exodus 20, 17. Thou shalt not covet uh, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's oxen, their Ford F-350, their big screen TV, whatever it is, thou shalt not covet, right? But how does that, how does that apply to God? If, if, if God is loving, it says God does not, love doesn't envy. How does that apply to God? Well, here it is. Envy is really close to is really close to coveting, and, and but 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 the Bible says that God is jealous for us. And and it actually says, and in, in, I don't know if you know this, but it actually says that the name of God is jealous in the Bible. Did you know that? That God's name is jealous. Exodus thirty four fourteen. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I am a jealous God whose name is jealous. So how can God be jealous? and not covet because he owns everything. See, if I'm coveting something, I'm coveting something that somebody else owns. But God can't because he owns everything, including us. And in James chapter 4, verse 5, it says, but, uh, but don't you know that the Spirit who dwells in you yearns jealously for you? So God owns everything and He yearns jealously for us when we start giving ourselves away to the world, as James is talking about. Um, he yearns jealously for us, but He can't covet, He can't envy because He owns everything. Does not parade itself, I can't do all these. I want to go down to does not seek its own. This is a big one. Does not seek its own. 
John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep, does not seek its own. For us, that's one of the, that's one of the big requirements for following Jesus. He says, Matthew 16, 24, he says, if anyone, anyone would desire to come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. So there's a lot in that does not seek its own. That's a daily thing, dying to ourselves daily, considering others better than ourselves, walk, you know, purposing to walk in this love. But I want to give us some application here in this because this is really big. I think this is really huge and I really wanted to hit this point tonight, uh, especially for us, for us men because we're, we're, we're priests and, and, and you know, over our household and, and uh, you know, uh, we're supposed to be building our, building our families up and uh, encouraging our wives and, and uh, you know, raising our kids up in the way that they should go. But they need an example to follow and we need to set that example. And when it says love doesn't seek its own, I think about what Jesus did. I think about Jesus in Mark chapter 3 where it says a long time before daylight, he got up and he went to spend time with the Father. And what Jesus knew and that we need to know and that he's teaching us is that when we give ourselves to the, we give, when we give ourselves, when we, when we willingly choose to go into that filling place where we can get with God, and he can give us, he can, he can pour out his heart towards us and we can fellowship with him and we can become more like him. We can get Holy Spirit can teach us the word and we take our word, guys, and we get up early, you know, five, four or five o'clock in the morning, whatever your schedule is. And we go into the secret place and we take our word and we say, Holy Spirit, teach me, teach me. And we do that not just for ourselves, but for the sake of our kids and for the sake of our wife, and that's where it starts. Ministry always starts at home, and then also for our, for our co-workers, our neighbors, our church family, because somebody's influencing somebody somewhere. Everybody has a sphere of influence. And when we get God's Word in us, He can get it out of us in that given moment, a given time. But it's a big deal. Jesus says this in John 17. He says, Father, I pray that you don't take them out of the world they're not of the world as I am not of the world. He says, but sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And he says, for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they too may be sanctified. See, that's the gospel. That's unselfish. That's giving yourself for the sake of others. And that's what God wants. That's how God wants to flow through us. Because when we do that, we're acting like Jesus. Amen? That's the, that's the game. That's the end game is to become that love, is to, uh, you know, pick up our cross and, and follow Jesus. And it's a daily, it's a daily thing. Don't beat yourself up about it if you're not doing it. Just, just say, God, I want a purpose to do that. I, I have a saying that, that I, that I kind of keep to, and it's this. I don't follow Jesus perfectly, but I follow him purposely. I don't read the Word of God and study the Word of God perfectly, but I do it purposely. Purpose-driven life. The purpose of our heart is, a, is, is that's the desire. That's releasing our desire. And that's, but don't, you know, perfect? No. On purpose? Yes. God can work with that. God can work with that, and He will does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. The very fact that this is in this shows us the depravity of man, that without God, we're in big trouble. The very fact that this is in here about love that does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth shows us that there's a big problem in the, in the, in, in the, the descent of, of, uh, of human life and of just that deception. Just think about that. Isaiah chapter 5, I think it's uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Guess what, guys? We're here. We're here. That's happening now. And so we need to rejoice in the truth. Rejoice in the truth. John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 3 says, I have no greater joy than to see my children walk in truth. So we need to champion that truth. Bears all things. That means to cover. It, means, it actually means a covering. 
And think about this, uh, fellas, as you think about your family. It bears all things. It covers. It protects. A lot of translation will say it protects, but it covers all things. Jesus says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I wanted to take you like a mother hen and take you in my arms and, and cover you. Psalms 91 says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest, will, will abide in the shell of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my hiding place. In Him will I trust. Surely He will cover me with His feathers and under His wings I will take refuge. It's covers, it covers, it protects, believes all things. Here's a big one too. We need to be speaking life into the, into, into the, the hearts of our kids and, and, our, and, and our friends and our, and our loved ones and our, and our family and our church family. Believes all things. You can do it. Instead of saying, you'll never do that or you never do that. You know, give them something to go for. Give them something to be encouraged about. I think about Paul and Onesimus. Uh, Paul and Philemon. Philemon's probably reading that letter and, and Paul says, I know you do the right thing. You know what? Paul really believes I'm going to do the right thing. And that, that must do something to you. You know, if somebody believes in you, that gives you some kind of, man, I'm going to do it. Right? I'm going to do it. It's a big deal. So speak that over your kids. Hope's all things. He's the God of hope who fills us with all joy and peace uh, so that we can abide, so we can uh, overflow with that same hope. Endures all things. It's kind of it's kind of close to uh, um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, endures all things, bears all things. Yeah, bears all things. Love never fails. I said it before, but love never fails. It means it never he'll never fall out of it'll never fall out. It actually means it actually means that word means to to go from a place of, 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 uh, of high uh, esteem to the lowest. And God's love will never fail. It'll never fail. He'll never fall out of love with us. I put that on my Facebook post the other day. All right, let me quickly uh, just go through the rest of the prophecies. But where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. That, that just means, you know, when, when and it says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. And I used to think that this meant uh, we know in part and we'll prophesy in part. We know in part. I used to think that meant we just know some of, of we just have some kind of an understanding of, of the Word of God and the mysteries of God, but it actually means we know in part. In other words, I know a part of it and you know a part of it. As the body of Christ, we all know parts of it. And together, we make up that, con that completeness and the oneness of the body. If you look it up, that's what it means. It means we're, we're parts of something. Uh, but when that which is perfect has come, I believe that's talking about the kingdom. That which is perfect has come, uh, will be, that which is in part will be done away with. Uh, we won't need prophecies. We won't need tongues. We won't need uh, all that knowledge because when the kingdom is consummated, we'll know in full, even as we're fully known. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. We're to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're never called to stand still. We're never called to be idle. We're always called to go. Advance the kingdom. The kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. We need to be following Jesus. He who doesn't gather with me scatters. We need to be growing up in the faith. The time to act like a child has already passed. We need to be grown up and, and, and growing in the Lord. And we don't think like a child anymore. We don't act like a child. We act mature. There's another place in here about love. It's not rude. That means it doesn't act inappropriate. There's always an appropriateness. Jesus always acted appropriate in the, in the, in the right situation, in the right time, and for the right reason. And that's what we need to do. We need to grow up in Christ. And the world, remember, remember this, somebody's watching us. They're looking at how we're behaving. Paul says, these things, fornication and uncleanness and uh, you know, anger and malice and all this stuff. It's just not fitting for saints. It's not going to fit. No matter how much you try to make it fit, it just won't fit. Because the Holy Spirit's going to keep telling you, Sean, this doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit. And so we need to listen to that voice and we need to put away those things, put away childish things. Talking to Pastor Jeff uh, the other day or this morning, and I'll close with this. But uh, let me just say, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but face to face. Now I know in part, but then I should know just as I also am known, and now by faith, hope, love, these things, but the greatest of these is love. Starts with love, finishes with love. We're going to end becoming the love of God. He's faithful to complete the work He started in us, and we will all come to that place. But, um, but you know, we need to, uh, we need to, there's a, there's a scripture in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. 
And, and Paul says this, he says, he says, uh, now, now, beloved, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We go around with this saying, you know, Christians aren't perfect, they're just forgiven. And we just kind of give ourselves a, uh, a, you know, an easy kind of, yeah, you know, and, and that mentality is going to cause us to stumble. It's going to cause us to fall. It's going to cause us to become passive. But we should be perfecting holiness in the fear of God because we love God. And that's, that's a daily walk too. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm there. But I'm just saying, is encouraging us all that because the Bible says in Hebrews that without holiness, no one's going to see God. And if we're going to try to become and walk in the love of God and purpose to walk in the love of God, then we want people to see Jesus in us, right? Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth, God. Uh, a lot uh, that we talked about tonight, God, I pray that um, that it will be rightly divided in the hearts that heard it, God. Uh, thank you, God, that you're always encouraging us into uh, your truth. And Holy Spirit, you're always leading us into truth. And I thank you for the opportunity, God, to share tonight. And I pray, God, that we would remember that only you, only you can truly see and perceive the motivation of our hearts. And when that motivation is love, that's what pleases you. And that's what Holy Spirit bears witness with. So I pray as dear children that we would walk in love as Christ also loved us, gave himself for us, an offering, sacrifice to you as a sweet smelling savor. Father, that we would, as living sacrifices, climb up on that altar, that holy fire altar, and burn for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.